Welcome to the ACC Panic Room alongside Lauren Brownlow. I'm Joe Ovias. A little Glen Gary, Glenn Ross for uh, for the Blue Devils last night against Wake Forest. Always be closing, Lauren. And they, they, they found a way to do it, even if it was a little controversial. And you know what? Here's the thing. You can't really listen to almost anything I say about Duke ever again. Because as much as we might criticize them for having these types of games at the end like they have, and they won this one, so credit to them. Mm -hmm. But I can't exactly say I didn't think they were going to win too because I, uh, I ended up going up a little early to the media room. As you know now, the media room is a bit of a hike from press row. It is difficult at times to get up there quickly, right? Especially if it's a, you know, and so I was just like, look, I'm going to just go at – it was especially crowded. It's been getting more and more crowded, I feel like, in the last couple of weeks. Students are back. I know. And I just was like, you know what? Duke's up 19. I'm going to head on upstairs, start writing, get ready for post game, get ready to cover this whole, like, Coach K didn't coach the second half story, right? Because that's what mm -hmm. we were sort of prioritizing. Yeah. As it keeps getting closer, I'm like, oh, man. And I almost, the thing is, too, I almost went out at the under four. But that was when Duke could pull back ahead by like nine before the under four. So I'm like, all right, we're done here again. Mm -hmm. And then almost no. And the thing is like, yes, Duke Duke made the plays it needed to down the stretch. Obviously, the Mark Williams dunk ends up counting and, and it should have based on what we could tell. Yeah. Um, now there's some Wake Forest. We'll get to that in a second. Yeah, some I guess Wake, there's like some, some Wake Forest fans want to get into about. the nitty gritty of basket interference and uh, at least my understanding of it. But But we'll continue. You know, yeah, and and so he they made the play they needed to make, and but I still think that even though Duke ended up coming out on top, it is alarming to see Duke struggle this much to close yes. out basketball games. Like I, I honestly cannot remember the last Duke team that had this issue more than once, maybe twice in a season, right? Well, Gilio and I talked about this last week on the air. And Julia went on a little bit of a rant about who's the bus driver, right? Somebody's got to drive the bus. All the great Duke teams have somebody that you know you can put the ball uh, in the hands of and they're going to take it over. This Duke team doesn't really seem to have that in the same way that even in the Zion Williamson year, there was some confusion as at the end as to who should right. have it. Should it be Zion? Should it be R.J. Uh, uh, Barrett? So the, I think that was the Michigan State loss uh, in the NCAA tournament. It was yes. in Barrett's hands when it shouldn't have been. At that point, yeah, somebody brought up that game to me was the last time Duke had this much okay. losing teams out. And that, I was like, yeah, but that's one game. That's, that's one game. But that's that's what I'm thinking right. of that's going to be – because that's yeah. the immediate thought that I have going forward for Duke in that if you haven't figured it out by now when you've had multiple instances where you should have had, like, the teachable moment, like, okay, if we're getting any of these closeout situations, it's twofold. One, there's a bus driver issue. Who do you want having the ball? It should be Paolo Bancaro, right? That's what it should be. Well, and it, it was actually, it was on that play. In and that Mark play, Williams, the two the two dudes who should be touching the basketball in that situation did. Did but somebody's usually got to pass them the basketball. But sometimes I sometimes I think it should be Trevor Keels. Yep, I was going to say that's the next logical person for me. I think he's really coming along, and like you can see him, I feel like get back closer and closer to full strength with each game. But I think Duke's bigger problem, this this particular Duke roster's bigger problem, isn't who gets the ball at the end. It's that they lose their composure. That's I know you pointed. I know you pointed this out uh, in the Virginia loss, where they clearly did not like it when a team did not back down and kept pushing back. And by the way, when did that wake run start to happen? It was in the midst of that that there was yet another like, and and I mean to be fair, I don't think. I understand why everybody involved reacted the way that they did. I don't think it's a big deal. You know, I think that Mark Williams thought that C from Wake Forest was standing over Trevor Keels and he didn't, he did kind of move him, which C took exception to. But it goes beyond um, that. Straight up pushed him. So, but it goes beyond that too. Yeah. Mark Williams is getting, look, was Mark Williams getting hosed with some of those calls? Yes. I but, mean, but, you know, ask Alondis Williams how he felt about some of his, you know? Sure. But that's my point. Right. You can feel that you get hosed, but you can't let, you got to keep, you got to play through. You got to play that, through. 
That's the thing. That last call too. Yeah, that was that. There was a bad call on Mark Williams. Then Alondis Williams had one on him that I thought was questionable. But a lot of some of his too, though, and even some of Mark's that I'm sitting there like, don't put yourself in that position. You know and what they I mean? do though. That's the thing. Duke continues to do that, and they lose a right. little bit of their composure. So I'll be curious. Like this, if this continues, if they don't, if, if they don't get this cleaned up, and, if, and at this point in the season, you kind of are who you are. But if if they can't clean it up by March. They're going to have a really quick run in the NCAA tournament. And that you gets know what back they remind me that... of a little bit? And no one involved is going to like this comparison. Oh? Strictly Duke at the end of basketball games. Okay. Just to be clear. Uh-huh. They remind me a little of that 2020 Carolina team. Ooh. Strictly at the end of close games, right? Ooh, because you were sitting there. No, because you were sitting there like, wow, Carolina, they're going to end up getting a win here. Amazing. Mm. What would they do in the final minutes? Meltdown. Right? I mean, I'm not wrong. No. It's not quite no, that bad, no, to be clear. But what happens is Duke might have been playing well the whole time. All of a sudden, they start turning the ball over in ridiculous ways. Like, yeah. that's the thing. It's not like Duke's just, like, missing shots. Like, they're also making bad decisions. That's the part we're not used to seeing. Like, mm-hmm. it's not like they're just, oh, they're not making shots. Okay, cool. They're also, like, dribbling it off their foot or making a horrendous pass or, like, something that you just don't expect Duke teams to do down the stretch of close games. It's just bizarre to watch. And like you said, maybe they are who they are. Maybe Trevor Keel's getting healthy helps them out and he can kind of take on that alpha role of the ball handling late that's the best case scenario yeah yeah. honestly i think that's the best case scenario for duke going forward i also i'm wondering if paulo bancaro is okay we might find out something at the end of the season yeah that's entirely well i mean like mentally as much as physically yeah i mean but they they all came out there showing support with uh with the shirts with the paulo bancaro shirts no, and I think it's – and, like, he's a great it's player, true. but I it's just fun. think he's been he's been kind of in a funk the last, I don't know, maybe five games now. If you look back at his numbers, like, it's not the same. They're going to get they're gonna get steak knives if they're not careful uh, at this rate. Now, about the end with the basket interference, you know, they waved it off immediately, and there was some yeah. pushback from fans as to, well, why are you immediately waving it off? I think they – sometimes I think officials make calls because that means it will enact a review because if they don't wave it off, they don't review it. Right. So, um, so they wave it off. They go to the review, and a lot of people were convinced that Wendell Moore had touched that ball. Wendell Moore never touched that ball. Yeah. It was it was Mark Williams the entire time, yeah, and it, it did Moore. exit the cylinder. The confusion seems to be over. I think if everybody agrees that the ball left the cylinder when – Mark Williams tipped it back. It becomes then a question of, well, did he actually ever have control of it? Is it back in the cylinder when he dunks it in? And what is the rule as it relates to, well, is the shot reset after he tips it? And it has so. it doesn't have to hit the rim? Because if it hits the rim and then he dunks it, well, then it's basket interference, clear, cut, dry. But the rules are seem a little bit nebulous. I think they got the right call in my understanding of it. But there seems to be some 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 pushback on that, which I understand. Yeah, and I and I I think like you saw Wake fans too, at least on my Twitter timeline. There, some of them, a lot of them were like, "Look, Duke's better than us," and yeah. you know. But some of those calls, I, I think it, they were just sad to not see Alondis Williams out there the whole game. But yeah, down the stretch, he was able to be in there, and and obviously it made a difference. But I mean, again, and the thing is, I got into it with some Wake fans too. Like he put himself in some of those positions, in my sure. opinion, to get called for some of those fouls. You, if you've got two, you got to just stay out of the way. And like I know that he didn't touch him on replay, but it looked to me in real time like he did on that third foul. So if it looked to me like that, it probably looked to the ref like that too. You just got to be careful in those situations. But yeah, I think there was some frustration there and some things that weren't going their way. And so I think that probably contributes to it. Well, but... even Steve, even Steve Ford's made a joke uh, because <laughs> oh I mean, they had 0.4 seconds on the clock. The ball almost goes in on yeah. the full court heave. But when you look at the replay, he did not, the ball did not leave his hands when the buzzer yeah. went off, but that didn't stop Steve Forbes, who I absolutely love Dude. making a joke about, not that it would have counted here. I was like, like probably oh. wouldn't have counted here. I guess oh. it wasn't counted here. Like yeah, Steve, we were Steve all like, Forbes, oh, Steve Forbes face. knows about the about the camera Dude, clock. He, he knows jokes, about the camera. He, he had jokes last night like crazy. Like He's apparently, because we were all talking about the hoodie, we were curious why, you know. Why was he wearing a hoodie last so night? Apparently I can't it was some sort of homage to Kay's Chicago roots or something. I didn't okay. catch the whole thing. I mean, Coach K doesn't come out for the second half because he's dehydrated apparently. Well, and you're wearing and a hoodie? Steve Forbes joked that like, 
I, he's like, I've been trying to take a picture with him all year. I guess he doesn't want to take a picture. With me. Well, it's, like, it, and we'll, and we'll close on this. It is odd that Mike Shashevsky and apparently Forbes and K are, are pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it is weird that we've now had two illnesses related to K that are not COVID related, well, specifically for the Wake game, because he obviously you know they didn't he didn't go to Winston Salem because of an illness. John Shire had to take over. He leaves to be tended to at halftime, doesn't come back out. John Shire is left to uh, coach again. Now, in a weird sort of way, this is not intentional, but, you know, in terms of a transition for John Shire, he's getting reps in some pressure situations, which I think is good for John Shire. But it is is kind of a weird weird footnote to the farewell season that the Wake Forest game and Mike Krzyzewski just not meant to be. I guess so. One one reason too, I think Coach K is is retiring is his perspective, his values and his perspective has shifted a bit in his older years. And yeah. you know, physically, I'm sure he's not as spry as he used to be. Time is undefeated, and so um, I think that's part of it. And then I think you know maybe the Coach K of 15 years ago or so, obviously the Coach K of 30 years ago or so, would have pe- tried to power through last night. Um, just, you know, probably just been like, give me an IV and I'll be fine. But I think he's just, he's not, he doesn't, for who, for what, you know, it's like, what's why, if I'm not feeling well and I'm not myself, I know that I have somebody on the bench that I trust. He's going to be Let doing Josh this picture anyway. Why force myself to do this when I don't have to? And it was, all, but the thing is the timing of it all was weird too. It's, co- it's all coincidental. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to make some larger point here. It's just, it's, it's, it was a strange day that was spent rehashing the Duke succession plan to John Shire. Well, and I thought he was going to have to answer those questions in post by himself. Thankfully, nobody asked. I think they felt a little for him because it's like, what's he supposed to do? It's not but his also, fault he's here. Like, But also, what is the... I don't know. What's no new? Knock on, no, no, this is no knock on the Ian O'Connor book, which I think has more interesting details yeah. to explore with Mike Krzyzewski, but specifically his relationship with Bob Knight. Yes. But my issue with the way things played out yesterday in rehashing this conversation with Mike Krzyzewski and John Shire is that it, it was exactly that, a rehash. Seth Davis and Brendan Marks of The Athletic in June of 2021, after this announcement had come out, went into details about how Tommy Amaker was a guy that Duke had targeted to be a successor and somebody that obviously Mike Krzyzewski would have been okay with. And they actually relayed the story that Kay and Amaker had had conversations about how things were going to go forward. And that included being an assistant under Mike Krzyzewski for a season. And I guess the new tidbit is that Amaker was heartbroken, which, yeah, man, you'd be heartbroken too if you don't get to go back to Duke and succeed Mike Krzyzewski. However... There's no new information in how Mike Krzyzewski wanted this to play out. And if you think about this logically, the way it was positioned as Mike Krzyzewski pushing Amaker out, to me, is sensational. That is a sensationalization of what happened. Right, and I was, I was going to say, too, can't wait for the Roy book where we he, where, where the breaking news becomes that, like, some people in the Carolina family wanted Wes Miller to be the coach, and it's going to be treated as brand new information because it came from someone national, I guess. Like, I, I guess, or New York media, or whatever it is. But if we think about this logically, if you're Tommy Amaker, who's been a coach for two decades, and you're 56 years old, and the yeah. conditions that are met to be the next head coach at Duke are that, yeah, if you're Tommy Amaker and you're Coach K, you have this adult conversation going, you know what? This ain't the right move for me. Like, this ain't something I'm going to yeah. be uh, be cool with. And on top of that, if you're a 56-year-old Tommy Amaker who has had your own autonomy, it's abundantly clear that Mike Krzyzewski is going to be lingering around the program in a way that Roy Williams is not at Carolina. And that might make more sense for somebody like John Shire in their 30s who's just starting out to have that element around rather than Tommy Amaker and Mike Krzyzewski, where they could potentially butt heads. And, of course, we've seen this play at other places, more specifically North Carolina. So all of this makes logical sense. And I don't, you know, people want to make this some sort of, they want to make it something that it's not. And I understand why, because it's Mike Krzyzewski. But let's get this to the base level. Mike Krzyzewski, in the same way that Roy Williams, have earned the right to make it abundantly clear how they want this thing to go forward. And if it doesn't pan out, well, then fine. Let the ADs and the presidents handle it from there. 
But both Roy Williams and Mike Krzyzewski, in the same way that Dean Smith back in 1997, yeah. made it abundantly clear how they want to make things play out. You earned that right. I'm okay with it. But because we don't like Mike Krzyzewski, we collectively, we're going to find problems with everything that he does, including this move. I, yeah, I just don't understand like why anyone is surprised in any sort of way that Mike Krzyzewski had a huge say in his successor. What like, a shock. Why Or why that would even be a problem. I just don't. Yeah. I mean, it's like you said, I mean, I, to me, I always assumed it was common knowledge that Dean Smith retired the way that he did. I mean, basically in like September before a basketball season, it was pretty late. It was September, October, it was right? October. It was October. It, it was, was October. October. So it literally at that point, the administration had no choice and had to promote Bill Guthrie, right? That was by design. Yes. And that's like, I assumed that was common knowledge at this point. And he did that because he cared that much about Bill Guthridge and he wanted to make sure that he would be a successor for at least one year, like full stop. Yeah. That's what he wanted. And he wanted to make sure that no shenanigans would be pulled if he retired earlier than that. Now, was he prob- was he sincerely debating whether or not to retire before that? Uh, yes. I'm not sitting here. I don't think anybody's saying that like he did that. Like he he knew in April and he was waiting on purpose or anything. I, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that when he made that decision, it was at least in part for that reason. I just assumed that was common knowledge and it's fine. Anyway, that's going to wrap it up for this edition of the ACC Panic Room. We will see you all this weekend to wrap up some ACC action.